Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. Welcome to Defense News Weekly. This week it's all Army as we bring you this episode from the show floor of the Association of the United States Army Conference in the heart of our nation's capital. Last year's show was virtual and this year it's in person and as you can see, it's wrapping up. Washington DC has some of the strictest COVID protocols in the nation, so you'll see us with masks while on the show floor. Some of our guests had the option to remove their masks for the interviews. We will bring you the latest Army news from the floor and show you the newest tech moving the Army forward. What's the state of the Army and where is it headed? We talked to the service's top leaders to find out. And which vehicle will replace a Bradley? We will round up the contenders for the obviously manned fighting vehicle competition. And finally, we'll get an inside look at the new version of the infantry squad vehicle. It's the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. The Association of the United States Army Conference in Washington, D.C. is not only a place for companies to show a competitive edge, but also for leadership to show their plans for the service. If you build it, they will come. We set up a studio on the show floor, and as always, Army leadership came to speak directly to Defense News. While at the booth, guests had the option to take off their masks for the interview. Ground Warfare reporter Jen Judson spoke to Secretary of the Army Christine Warmoth. The Army outlines modern, has outlined modernization priorities and they've, they've staunchly protected them um, and supported how they rank. Um, is that getting a fresh look now? Uh, you know, some analysts out there have wondered you know, whether the priorities are, are ranked uh, appropriately to address China, for instance. Um, so are you taking a look at that? Is that on the table? My own view is... Um, one to end lists are not very helpful um, or particularly okay. meaningful. And frankly, you know, when you look at the six um, major modernization areas, there are interdependencies there. Sure. So, yeah. you know, the, the network, for example, is, you know, is foundational across Absolutely. next generation vehicles, future vertical lifts, integrated air and missile defenses. So I think we need to be thinking more about capability sets than a one to end ranking of the six priority areas. Very interesting. All right, well, I'll, I look forward to seeing how that flushes out um, with your analysis. Um, you also talked in your speech on Monday uh, about how you really are going to take a hard look because you need to make decisions now, uh, you know, across the board from readiness to modernization to infrastructure. Um, and so with that, you know, is, is the Army willing to consider a reduced end strength? You know, the Chief was adamant earlier this year that no, the end strength is going to, it cannot go lower in, uh, than it is budgeted in fiscal 2022. Um, but, but budget analysts have said, you know, that it's really only a matter of time before the Army really has to choose between the two. Um, what are your thoughts about that? You know, do you think the Army really is going to have to make the tough decision between end strength and modernization? Um, or are, do you believe that the Army will continue to find ways to um, you know, keep the end strength where you want it and also pursue your modernization priorities? Well, I think, first of all, we have to think about the fact that, one, we want to see where Congress uh, lands in terms of what the ultimate defense budget is going to be for this year. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, that's an important data point and I think is also going to be an important data point as the administration looks at future budget requests to yeah. Congress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's too soon to sort of start saying, you know, end strength is on the table, end strength is off the table okay. in that regard. You know, we also, too, have the national defense strategy right. that is still under development. And, then, okay. and that, I think, you know, will also be an important data point in terms of assessing what is the demand going to be for Army forces. Um, but as I've said, you know, since, since my confirmation hearing, I think we do have to look at the sort of three big levers of 
and strength for structure modernization. Well, it's, I've now expanded my three levers to four. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really looking at end strength and force structure, modernization, readiness, mm -hmm. and uh, how do you balance across those three, those three you know legs of the stool. Okay. So I, I want to look holistically and comprehensively and think about how do we make ourselves the best army that we can be most relevant to the joint force mm -hmm. inside of finite resources. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm looking at everything. I'm going to segue into asking you a little bit about the climate strategy. And I know that's going to uh, hopefully come out sometime this fall. And you're you know, in, in final edits at, at this point. Um, so I'm hoping you can highlight a little bit of um, what uh, is going to be part of the strategy. Uh, you know, what are some of the main principles and priorities that you're going to lay out there? Sure. We're looking at, um, first of all, sort of four lines of effort. Um, everything from helping us think uh, more clearly about how climate change is going to affect us, you know, whether it's our ability to train at home or to operate uh, outside of the country, base resilience, uh, and then really looking at sort of operational energy and sustainment. What we want to do is really put down some tangible goals for where we want to go, consistent with the president's goal of basically having us reduce greenhouse gases by 50% and to have us go to um, all uh, carbon-free electric sources by 2030. So we want to really layer in some milestones for us to reach as an army, because I think we could be a leader inside of the department given the scale of the army itself. Absolutely. Oh, and what about, you know, operating uh, as climate obviously is changing now. Um, you know, we're looking at operating more seriously in the Arctic. The Army has the Arctic strategy that they rolled out um, earlier. So uh, how are you approaching uh, just preparing the Army to be able to operate in very extreme uh, temperatures, hot, cold? Um, you know, how are you incorporating that into training and also into the things that you're developing uh, to, to make, make it easier on them to operate in those environments? Well, extreme weather is definitely going to be a factor for us as we look at training. And so one way we're doing that, for example, in the cold weather climates is having our soldiers actually train in Alaska. So instead of necessarily you know, bringing folks who are stationed in Alaska to Fort Irwin, for example, we're actually going to do some of those major training events in Alaska or similarly in Hawaii where it's more of a jungle environment. But on a smaller scale, you know, we're having to deal with it in ways like, for example, when I went to Fort Jackson to visit some of our trainees going through basic training, mm -hmm. they basically, because we have so many more days of the year that are very high temperatures, they have these kind of um, barrels basically filled with ice and we're now teaching our soldiers to avoid getting overheated by sinking their arms up to their armpits into these yeah. ice buckets. And wow. it really helps reduce yeah. your core body temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's just you know one example. And I think we're going to have to find more and more uh, exactly. ways to deal with that kind of a temperature environment. Broader picture, uh, the 2018 National Defense uh, Strategy identified five leading threats, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and terrorism. Uh, do you believe any of those threats are less serious today than they were in 2018? And I know that, that you're very, you, you adamantly included this in your speech, that China is the pacing threat. But how are you approaching some of these, you know, the other th threats that we've identified in recent years? Those other, other threats are absolutely out there, and we're going to have to deal with them. I think what has changed, if you will, is, uh, um, is more the realization, I think, of the profound nature of the China challenge. Yes. Okay. It's not so much that the other challenges, Russia, Iran, North Korea, terrorist groups, have diminished. Um, it's more of a, a relative weighting of importance. But we're still going to be focused on deterring Russia, dealing with North Korea, dealing with Iran. That's not going away. Right. Is there any other observations from AUSA that you'd, you'd like to share? Um, anything else that you've seen or heard um, that you know has, has stuck with you? Uh, you know that you plan to take into uh, your leadership role. Well, I mean, I think first of all, it was just great to have everyone back here in person, uh, even if we are are wearing masks still. Hopefully, <laughs> by next year, that will will have moved beyond that. Um, but, uh, you know, my sense is there's just a great appreciation for everything that the Army has done and uh, how flexible we've been this year in particular in terms of taking on 
natural disasters, capital security, right. Operation Allies Welcome, the, the evacuation out of uh, Afghanistan. It's been a busy year. And Pandemic management. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I just appreciate all of the positive energy at AUSA for everything that the Army has been doing. Thanks, Jen. You can see that and more AUSA interviews at defensenews.com. When we return, we see the competitors for the optionally manned fighting vehicle program. The military and defense market is constantly evolving. Stay on top of the latest news with Sightline Media Group's live events. Continue to learn, understand new tools and technologies. We're live, you're on in three. Defense, two, government, one. and industry leaders come together for successful and proven engaging events. You'll gain valuable insight, get the chance to ask questions, all from the comfort of your own home or office. Sign up for our events newsletters and receive alerts for upcoming live streams. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. Once again, I'm on the show floor of the AUSA conference in Washington, DC. This conference is one of the premier defense trade shows in the world. The big competition is that to replace the Bradley with an optionally manned fighting vehicle or OFMV. The Army chose five companies to compete. Ground Warfare reporter Jen Judson rounded up those competitors. The Army's embarking in a competition to replace our Bradley Infantry fighting vehicle with an optionally manned fighting vehicle. And the Army has selected five teams to develop concepts for the vehicle. Not designs, but just concepts. So here at AUSA, we are seeing at a lot of the booths here with the, for the competitor teams, uh, technology that will be incorporated into an optionally manned fighting vehicle, but not necessarily the vehicle itself. Behind me is a technology demonstrator, the RB301 at BAE Systems, one of the competitors for the OMFV competition. And this is not the OMFV vehicle, but it does display some of the technology that will be incorporated into an ultimate design. BAE is particularly focused on 360 degree situational awareness. Outside of the vehicle, there are cameras, so you can see inside basically a 360 degree view of the outside. It can see everything. In addition to that, there's situational awareness offered off the Elbit turret. Next up, we'll see what Ryan Mittal has at their booth. We're here at the Ryan Mittal booth where they are showing off their Lynx OMFV design concept for uh, the Army's program. There's a lot of open architecture capability here, including the ability to swap in and out the gun systems. The, the Lynx KF-41 has an open architecture to start with. It is based upon the NATO generic vehicle architecture, so we already have MOSA, as you, as you see a lot of talk about that. So we have that. We're adapting our MOSA architecture to the U.S. Army requirements that we just recently received last week. So that's the, the number one important characteristics, I think, that OMFE is going after, which is growth capability. That MOSA capability allows, it, allows us to more rapidly integrate new technologies as they, as they mature and get them to the field. Oshkosh here at the show is showcasing their partnerships for the optionally manned fighting vehicle concept design phase. Uh, they're already partnering with Hanwha, a South Korean company well known for their vehicle development, uh, as well as Raphael, Pratt & Miller, Plasson, and Kinetic. You're teaming up with Hanwha. Can you talk a little bit how, about how you're approaching all of this now in the concept phase together? Well, absolutely. Uh, our approach to this program is really to build a consortium of industry experts uh, in lethality and the combat vehicle space. You see our partners with Hanwha, Rafael Advanced Defense Systems, Plasan, Kinetic. Really, our goal is to build a team who bring a core competency in the combat vehicle and lethality space. Uh, as much their innovation and technology and flexibility and design approach as it is their core technologies that they bring to the table. That way we can leverage the team's capabilities as the design requirements iterate over time working with our government customer. Up next is Hanwha. The Oshkosh Hanwha team is basing their design, a point of departure uh, from the Redback vehicle. They're using the chassis uh, as inspiration for the design uh, that they're in right now in the concept phase. Um, they're very focused on survivability 
as well as a composite rubber track they're bringing to the table potentially that makes for an easier ride. And they also have a very unique suspension system uh, that they will also likely incorporate uh, if they continue on into the next design phase. I've had a relatively good night's sleep. I've changed my clothes. We're back here at day three at AUSA and I'm at the General Dynamics Land Systems booth, uh, standing right in front of their Catalyst Technology Demonstrator vehicle. General Dynamics Land Systems is unveiling at AUSA a fifth generation electronic architecture. The open architecture system is dubbed Catalyst and is considered the heart of the optionally manned fighting vehicle technology design for General Dynamics Land Systems. As part of General Dynamics Land Systems technology development, they're also working on robotic vehicles. Uh, they've brought T-Rex to the show, uh, which showcases some of their other partnerships that will be uh, a part of an OMFV concept design. The award of one of the design contracts went to point blank and surprised everyone tracking the optionally manned fighting vehicle competition. Point Blank is a non-traditional company with no experience building combat vehicles, but they do have experience in the security world building vehicles uh, from the ground up there. Point Blank's offering should ultimately generate a hybrid electric drivetrain, survivability from that experience building security vehicles, and exportable external power uh, should all be things that we may see in their ultimate design. Thanks again, Jen. When we return, we get tips from personal finance expert Jeanette Mack. She'll show us how to avoid text message scams. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union and personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives us tips on avoiding text message scams. Ever receive a text message from a company you recognize but the message didn't seem real? That's called a phishing text. Cyber criminals use text messaging as a way to trick you into sharing your personal and financial information so they can steal your identity. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission reported that $86 million was lost in 2020 from fraud originating in scam texts. To protect yourself, be wary of messages asking for things like your social security number or bank account number. Avoid clicking on any links in the text message and never respond to a suspicious message. Instead, call the phone number that you know to be real, the one on the company's website or from the back of your credit card to validate whether the message was actually sent by them. If it wasn't, block the phone number. Your wireless carrier can help you if you don't know how. Finally, if you do fall victim to credit card fraud or identity theft, report the unauthorized transactions to your financial institution. By staying vigilant, you'll know how to spot scam messages of any kind and take the necessary steps to protect your identity and your money. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more military and defense news, be sure to check out Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for the latest stories and coverage. We also have an entire section devoted to AUSA. And to get a list of top stories in your email every weekday, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, we get an inside look at the new version of the Infantry Squad Vehicle. Welcome back. General Motors Defense announced that it has turned its infantry squad vehicle into a heavy gun carrier. The vehicle is based on GM's 2020 Chevrolet Colorado SR2 midsize truck. The version on display has a 50 caliber gun on top and M240s on the side. Jen Judson has more. Steve, tell us a little bit about um, what you've brought to the show here. Um, it looks like there's some added firepower on this vehicle, so talk about what you brought. Yeah, so we're really excited to be here, right, and uh, you've seen our ISV vehicle, and what we've done recently is taken that light, agile, nine-troop nine transporter designed for all-terrain and turned it into an electric vehicle. So what you see behind me here is our EISV, or our, or our all-electric military concept vehicle. The reason why we've done that is twofold. One is we want to demonstrate that we have the ability, General Motors Defense is bringing this huge investment from GM 
in advancing electric, autonomous, and commercial and, and connected vehicles. We're now doing that in the defense market as well. Obviously, we're doing it in the commercial market. Now we can translate that into requirements that meet soldier needs. So this vehicle, within a number of weeks, we took a standard ISV, we took out the internal combustion engine, we replaced it with a battery electric propulsion system, and now we've had this vehicle out with the, you know, we've had it with the Army at the MCOE at Fort Benning. We've had the Ranger Regiment is evaluating it. We have a lot of special operations forces. It's really a great capability. The other aspect that I'll talk about is you can see there's some other things on it now. We're highlighting uh, to, today at the show a remote weapon station with a minigun, so upgun capability. And if you look way up, you can see the UAV over it. What we're demonstrating is that when you go to an all-electric vehicle, it opens the aperture in what you can do in terms of mission systems. So when you bring organic power like we have in this, battery power, you can silently power a number of different capabilities. ISR assets, the UAV to fly forward to be able to visualize the battle space ahead of the troops, the weapon systems. All these power demands are handled by our battery electric power. So we're really excited about it. Absolutely. So talk a little bit more about the electrification process and GM Defense, you're really, you're really interested in going all the way to all electric, not just hybrid. Um, so talk about how you've been going about doing that on the military side. Yeah, so on the military side, the, the challenge is not that we can't build an electric vehicle. I mean, GM is going to build, you know, millions of electric vehicles now. We've made this commitment to an all electric future. So when you translate those to defense requirements, if you look at rear echelon uh, activities now, base operations, we can do that today. There's infrastructure that exists that we could plug vehicles in and charge them up, and we're, we're developing new fast charging capabilities. All will be applicable in the defense world. What's different in the defense environment is the ability to move vehicles like this to the tactical edge, to operate them in the fight. And so what we're doing with our all-electric concept vehicle is getting soldier feedback. We use these soldier touch points to give us insight how we can best develop the next generation of electric vehicles. And when it comes to the next generation electric vehicles, the E, the, so the ELRV, the electric light reconnaissance vehicle, that's going to be the Army's first fully electric vehicle built from the ground up. Just like we did with the ISV, which was built on a Chevy Colorado, a great vehicle, we're going to build the EIS, the ELRV, on on uh, the um, the Hummer EV. So you may have seen, you know, we're just now getting it into the first production vehicles have been built. They're going into showrooms now. GMC's Hummer EV is an amazing vehicle. It's a thousand horsepower super truck. We have that now to build the you know the the Army's first all electric vehicle on and we'll be doing that working very closely with the army as we prepare for the rfp to to offer the uh, elrv based on the hummer ev all right and that's all the time we have for this week please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week